come halfway across the world to speak at this conference, and I wake up this morning, and I have no voice, which is not ideal, uh, considering I was meant to be speaking in a few hours. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, I will be taking a few breaks to have a few uh, drinks. So I feel very fortunate and privileged to, to be here, and I'm really excited, actually, to share some of the work that we've been doing uh, looking at float and, and recovery in elite athletes. Um, I just want to uh, acknowledge the organisers of this conference. Um, thank you very much, not only for putting on a, a fantastic conference, but also for uh, bringing me all the way over here uh, from little old uh, New Zealand. Is there anyone else here actually from New Zealand? One person at the back? One or two at the back? Okay. It's a little bit annoying because I won't be able to make up stuff about New Zealand um, with some Kiwis in the crowd. So just to, to give you a little bit of background about New Zealand, um, for those that don't know, so if we actually appeared on a world map, we would appear about here. <laughs> Unfortunately, like this one from Ikea, uh, we don't always feature on the world map, so we have to draw it on ourselves. So we're a small country, we're a small country of less than 5 million, which I understand is uh, uh, even smaller than the state of Colorado. And some of the things that New Zealand is known for are our beautiful scenery, our beautiful landscapes, uh, beautiful walking trails, those sorts of things. And I thought I'd just share a, a quick little story from, from what happened uh, the other day. So when I got in, um, uh, to Denver, I decided to go to the gym here at, at, at the hotel, and I uh, wanted to go and run for about 30 or 40 minutes on the treadmill to try to get rid of some of that jet lag. So I went and stood on the treadmill, and, and, and I started running, and, and um, this screen sort of come up uh, on the treadmill, as you can see here, with a random video. So I was running and, and watching this video, and it moves along, so you feel like you're running on this beautiful trail. And then about a minute into this run, I thought, actually, this place looks quite familiar. <laughs> and so I keep running, and, I, and then I thought, yeah, this is a running track in New Zealand that I do regularly. Um, <laughs> and just to illustrate how small New Zealand is, as I was running on this track, I actually saw one of my friends from high school. <laughs> so some of the other things that New Zealand is known for is our adventure tourism. Uh, things like bungee jumping, and for some of you, you may recognize um, Lord of the Rings was actually um, filmed in New Zealand as well. But probably the most common thing that people know about New Zealand is our national rugby team, uh, the All Blacks. Now, the All Blacks are one of the most... Uh, are there some Australians in this audience? <laughs> the All Blacks are one of the most successful professional sporting teams in history in any sport. They have a winning percentage of around 80%. And in, in, uh, in New Zealand, in, in our biggest city, which is Auckland, at the stadium there where, where they play often, they haven't lost a game in over 25 years. Thank you. <laughs> now, I know some of you will be sitting there thinking, yeah, that's all right to be good at a sport that no one else in the world plays. So I thought I'd show you that we're okay at some other sports as well. So what we have here on this slide is, is two figures showing uh, the Olympic medal tally for 2012 London and 2016 in, in Rio. Now this tally is, is scaled for per head of population. And so pretty regularly we, we come in the top three uh, on the scaled medal tally. So we do go quite well uh, at sport. Now you may be thinking, <laughs> who is this proud Kiwi bragging about sport? What's the purpose of this? The reason I tell you this is that we don't have the luxury of having hundreds and thousands of, of athletes. So the athletes that we do have, we have to look after them. And so what that means is that we have to pay a lot of attention to things like sports science, to load monitoring, and just to make sure that our athletes don't overtrain, get injured, or get ill. And I think that's something that we do fairly well in New Zealand, same, same in Australia. Uh, we do a good job of looking after our, our athletes. And one of my main areas is athlete recovery. So this is an area that I've been um, researching and, and, and publishing papers in for probably the last 10 or, or 12 years. And 
I like to show this pyramid when I talk about athlete recovery. So in the top part of the pyramid, these are what I call the one or two percenters. Okay, so at the very elite level, the one or two percenters are still very, very important. They may be the difference between winning a medal at the Olympic Games or not. Uh, but the bottom half of this pyramid, these three down here, these are what I call the fundamentals of recovery, or the big rocks, if you like. So we have sleep, which is um, massively underrated, uh, not only in, in athletes, but also in, in general population. And we heard some of that yesterday from, from Josh's talk. Uh, and that's the area that I do most of my research in at the moment, sleep, um, trying to enhance sleep for, for athletes. Uh, nutrition, also vitally important, uh, making sure that uh, recovery nutrition is, is optimal for our athletes. And then just general periodization. So just making sure that um, the training load is adequate and there's enough rest and recovery. So when it comes to the, um, the one percenters, you'll, you'll note that I, that I put float up there. So I think if we're looking at uh, acute recovery, so if we're looking at uh, doing a float between exercise sessions, for example, on the same day, I think it probably is maybe a one or two percenter in terms of performance uh, enhancement. But one of the things that I really like about float is it has the potential to impact and influence one of the fundamentals of, of recovery, which is sleep. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of data that we've been uh, collecting around that um, recently. And just uh, I just threw this slide in uh, last minute, and um, one of the, the things that, that we've done is develop an athlete-specific sleep behavior questionnaire. So we published this in, in Sleep Science in 2018. And, and the, way, the thing we did was we, we sampled hundreds of athletes all around the world, elite athletes, some of the world's best athletes, to design this questionnaire and find out what are the unique challenges that athletes actually face with their, with their sleep compared to sort of a healthy non-athlete population. And we came up with uh, 18 items, and you can see them up there. Um, and what the athletes do now, this has become very well used all around the world, and, you, and you're welcome to use it yourself if you're working with athletes. So what they do is they fill out these 18 items uh, on this scale, and anything where the, the athlete indicates, perhaps sometimes frequently or always, we will usually look at what that item is, and then we will try to um, stage an intervention or try to work on that and, and try to uh, help them out with whatever they're struggling with. And I was just thinking about this yesterday as I was, I was listening to a couple of the talks, and I thought, actually, float could have, a, have its place in a number of these um, maladaptive sort of sleep behaviours that athletes are having. So things like item seven, I go to bed with sore muscles. We know that float may, may reduce uh, muscle soreness, and I'll talk about some of our data soon. Um, so maybe that could impact there. Also, item eight and nine, more psychology, um, thinking about their sporting performance when they're lying in bed or worrying about other things when they're, they're lying in bed. Um, item 10, uh, sorry, uh, not 10, uh, 14. So we have I wake myself and or my bed partner with muscle twitching. Perhaps we can uh, use float to, to um, try to reduce that. And then 18, we have travel gets in the way of building a, a consistent sleep-wake routine. So elite athletes are having to travel a lot. Perhaps we could be using float more to, to counter that jet lag and the travel sort of fatigue. So today I'm going to share two studies that, that we've uh, been working on. And this first one is, is a bit older now. So this was published in 2016, and, and some of you would have seen it. And what we did in this study, this was um, the data was collected leading up to the 2012 uh, Olympics in London. And this is when I was working in Australia at the Australian Institute of Sport. And we just wanted to have a, a really simple look at athletes that were using uh, float tanks. Now, all the athletes in this study were habitual users, so they'd all been doing uh, floating for quite a while. We had 60 elite athletes, which is a, a pretty good number. So they're all international standard. Uh, a lot of them went on to compete at, at the Olympic Games, uh, the ones that were in the study. And what we did was we just wanted to have a look at uh, mood state pre and post uh, a one-off float. So we used a multi-dimensional mood state questionnaire, uh, which had 16 items on it, and then we also had a perceived muscle soreness uh, questionnaire. So the participants were pretty even split uh, between male and female, 28 male and 32 female. 
So in terms of the results, so this is just showing uh, the 16 different items on the, the mood state questionnaire that we used. And this is the delta or the pre to post change, pre to post change, uh, float change. What we have here is uh, the asterisk represents a statistically significant difference pre to post. Um, and because I don't think that uh, statistical significance necessarily always tells the full story, I also like to um, show uh, effect sizes using Cohen's D effect sizes. So I think effect sizes are really helpful because, it, because they just give us a, more of an idea about the actual magnitude of, of the change that we're seeing. So we found uh, significant pre to post changes in 15 out of the 16 mood state variables pre to post float in these 60 elite athletes. The only thing that didn't change was, was the feeling of being alert. And if we have a look at some of the effect sizes, so if we just look at the, the large ones that are bolded, um, so they were feeling less worn out, uh, they were feeling less tired, they were feeling more relaxed, they were for feeling more at ease, less tense, and then more fresh. Uh, yeah, fresh. In terms of our muscle soreness, we also had a significant decrease, which was associated with a, a large effect size. One of the interesting things from this study was that um, we decided to, to sort of follow up with the athletes after they filled out their questionnaire and that sort of thing and ask them, did they fall asleep or did they nap during their float? And so what we did was once we, we found out how many of them napped and there was uh, 27 that napped or reported napping, I know it's a bit of a crude measure, it's sometimes hard to know if you actually do fall asleep in the tank. 27 napped, 33 didn't. Uh, and then we did uh, some further analysis. So this figure here is showing the um, effect sizes uh, for the same 16 uh, different mood state variables. The double hashtags um, refer to a moderate uh, effect size. And we actually found some pretty interesting findings that perhaps when these athletes were napping during their float, they were getting even uh, more benefit in terms of these mood state variables. So things like um, feeling even less uh, worn out, more relaxed, more at ease, less tense, more fresh, and less exhausted when they're napping, with the ones that napped versus the ones that, that didn't nap. Now we've seen a real exponential rise, I think, in, in athletes using float tanks. And, and there's lots of reports about high profile athletes, uh, not just over here, but also uh, in our country in New Zealand, uh, using tanks and reporting the benefits. And I think with this increase in, in athletes using float tanks and that sort of thing, uh, the mainstream media has also really picked up on it and, and run a lot of stories about it, about these athletes using them. And one thing that I've noticed in reading uh, some of these media stories is that often they will cite uh, that, that paper that we published in, in 2016. And that sometimes confused me because I thought it was in by no means a comprehensive study. It was really just a pilot uh, quick and easy study uh, to look at float. And I thought, why do they always cite this paper? And it turns out that there's hardly any research looking at published research uh, looking at float in, in athletes, especially elite athletes. So it really did make me feel like uh, we, we have to do more in this space. We really need to do more. So that brings us um, to our newest study. Um, so this one's hot off the press. We only finished this one um, earlier this year, and it's in review at a journal, and it's looking pretty positive. So I'm hoping it's going to be published in the, in the next few weeks, so you'll be able to uh, have a look at it when, it when it comes out. So this time, we decided to have a bit more of a comprehensive look into, into floating with uh, athletes. And we had 20 well-trained team sport athletes. And what we wanted to do was actually look at fatiguing them using an exercise task at night. And then following that, they would either float or, or do a control trial, uh, and then they would go home and go to bed, they would sleep, and then the next day, uh, they would come back and do a whole heap of um, measures. So just to talk you through to the design of, of this study, and this is quite a, um, a busy slide, but I will walk you through it. Uh, so it was a, a randomized uh, crossover trial where they did a, f a float and uh, a control. The control was sitting in a reclined chair in a dim lit room uh, no phones or anything like that, so, so pretty relaxing as well. So what we did was at 6.30 at night, uh, the athletes came in and did a whole heap of pre-exercise testing measures. I'll talk through those in a second. 
At seven o'clock, we uh, fatigued them, so we used a, an exercise task to, to fatigue the athletes. Then we had another testing session of the same measures, and this was just to make sure that we were actually causing fatigue in these athletes, see that we were seeing a drop in some of these measures. At 7.55, they had their one-hour recovery period, uh, and then at 8.55, we did some more measures, and then they went home to bed. So they wore, when they went home, they wore a um, wrist actigraph, uh, a fatigue science ready band is what we use, um, which has been validated against uh, polysomnography for actually measuring different aspects of, of sleep. Next morning they came back and, and did all the measures and then we, we tracked some of the measures uh, 24 hours post as well. So just to talk through uh, quickly the, the measures that we took, um, we had salivary cortisol, we wanted to get a, a measure of, of stress, so we took that at multiple uh, different t time points. We would have liked to have taken blood, but um, wasn't practical in our setting. We had some perceived measures of muscle soreness and physical fatigue using validated uh, uh, scales. Has anyone seen one of these devices before? No, so this is called a pressure to pain algometer. So what this does is it actually tells us about the pressure to pain threshold. So you push this device down on a muscle group and then the athlete or the patient signals when the sensation changes from pressure to pain. So we use this on three different lower body muscle groups. Our strength measure was an isometric mid-thigh pull. We had a speed measure, which was a 15 meter sprint where we took five, 10 and 15 meter time splits. And then we also had a repeated sprint test. So they did uh, three of these sprints on a 20 second rotation. We had a power measure, which was a counter movement jump. So this is a counter movement jump uh, where we attached a uh, linear position transducer. This is the, the tether that's att attached to the bar here. Uh, and the athletes would do three jumps and we would take the best uh, measure of analysis. Now in terms of the actual exercise or fatigue task, we used something called the ba basketball exercise simulation test. And, it, and this was created by some uh, colleagues in Australia. And it's uh, designed to match the actual physical demands of a basketball game. So that's what we used as our sort of exercise task or, or fatigue measure. Okay, so what do we find? Just to have a look at the cortisol first. Now this figure here is just showing uh, just the, the float condition, so not the control condition. Uh, so the green bars here um, are the overall mean for the whole group, and then the individual lines are all the, all the individual athletes. So as you can see here, on average, uh, cortisol levels went up quite a bit pre to post exercise. This was a significant increase in, in cortisol, and then we saw a significant decrease from post exercise to post float. So while this change here was significant when just looking at the, the float condition, there was no significant difference uh, between the control and the float uh, conditions, which was quite, quite interesting. And I think perhaps one of the reasons for that was that the control trial was also really relaxing. Um, so they were in the dim lit room, they were reclined on a chair, um, they weren't allowed to use their phones or, or watch any TV or anything like that, so it was also a pretty relaxing. But you could probably suggest, so this is the pre to post change in cortisol as a percentage, and you could, you could suggest that maybe there was a trend to it for it um, being greater in, in the float trial. Okay, so let's have a look at some of our other measures. Um, sleep, my favorite one. So, as I said, we measured this using um, actigraphy, and I'll just talk you through what all these measures are. So. The first one is actually just a perceived sleep quality out of 10. So we see 7.7 .7 after float, 5.9 after uh, control. Uh, these are the p-values, so showing the statistical significance. This was the only statistically significant um, difference between trials uh, for the sleep variables. Um, but what I've also got here is, again, the effect sizes, because I think that tells us uh, um, sometimes a better story. So that was associated with uh, a large effect size for perceived sleep quality in favor of the float uh, condition. Sleep latency is the, the amount of time it takes you to fall asleep. So after they floated, on average, they fell asleep in 15 minutes uh, versus 20 minutes uh, in the control trial. And this was associated with a, a small effect size in favor of the, the float condition. 
Total sleep time, uh, six hours 43 after float, six hours 31 after the control. So not great sleeps, they're not very long sleeps. Uh, this was associated with a small effect size again in favor of float. Sleep efficiency is the amount of time spent sleeping divided, the, divided by the time spent in bed. Uh, and that was 90 after, after float, 86 after control. Again, associated with a small effect size. Wazo is wake after sleep onset. So once you actually fall asleep, how much time do you spend, uh, spend awake uh, during the night? Um, so 20 minutes for float and 29 for, for control. Again, small effect size. Next two ones I won't go through, but awakenings per hour and wake episodes also asso associated with small effect sizes in favor of float. And then this one here, which was almost statistically significant, uh, mean wake duration. Uh, this is every time that they woke up during the night, what was the mean duration that they would actually stay awake for? 5.4 minutes for float and 7.4 for control. So some pretty good findings um, for, for float um, in terms of enhancing sleep there. So let's have a look at muscle soreness. So this was another um, really good finding uh, for the float group. So what we have here is our one to 10 scale of muscle soreness. So we have the different time points. So pre-exercise, post-exercise, post-recovery. Uh, so that's immediately post-recovery. So after the float or the control. 12 hours post, so that's the next morning. And then 24 hours post. So same with all of the figures that I'm, I'm going to show you. They're the same uh, layout. So the green line refers to the float condition and the black line refers to the control condition. Now these symbols up here, the purple ones, they just refer to where the significant differences between group groups occurred and at what time point. So as you can see here for muscle soreness, significant differences between groups, floating control groups at all time, po uh, time points. And these were associated with moderate to large effect sizes. So lower muscle soreness after float. Okay, so physical fatigue uh, followed a pretty similar profile, maybe not as significant as, as the muscle soreness uh, measures, uh, but we did have a significant difference between float and control at 12 hours post. So this was the, the pressure to pain algometer. The three muscle groups that we used for this were, were the vastus medialis, uh, the vastus lateralis, and the gastrocnemius. All three showed the same results pretty much, so I'm just going to show you the vastus lateralis uh, results here. So we had a significant difference between control and, and float for having a higher pressure to pain threshold after the float condition. So that's a good finding, right? So the green here uh, shows that at 12 hours post, so when they came back the next morning after they had uh, done their float and then went to bed, came back, uh, they had a higher pressure to pain uh, threshold. The isometric mid-thigh pull, uh, this was not uh, statistically significant in terms of the differences between the trials, but there was a small effect size in favor of float uh, the next morning. In terms of sprint performance, so on the left here we have 15 meter sprint time. Um, we also have five and 10 meter splits, but I thought I'd just show you the 15 meter splits. And we saw a significant difference between control and float Again, in favor of float running faster sprint times the next morning uh, here, which was associated with a small effect size. In terms of the repeated sprint, so this is the total time it took them to, to run three 15-meter uh, sprints, uh, was a not significant, but a small effect size, again, in favor of, of the, the float condition. Uh, Counter-movement jump performance, we had a significant difference here between groups, uh, again, in favor of, of the float uh, condition. So what? Uh, so what is the summary, I guess, of, of this research? And I think um, you, you've all seen it there. There's some really positive results in there, but let's just talk through each one what we actually sort of found. So in terms of the, the cortisol, we don't know. At the moment, we don't really know. So there was a significant reduction pre to post in, in the float trial. Uh, but that difference was not significantly uh, uh, different between, between the two trials. Sleep, we'll give that the thumbs up because uh, we saw some pretty good findings there. While there was only a significant difference in the perceived sleep quality, uh, there were some pretty good effect sizes for uh, things like sleep latency, total sleep time, sleep efficiency, wake after sleep onset, and, and so on and so forth. So some good findings there. 
In terms of muscle soreness and fatigue, again, this is probably the most significant findings that we found in this study. Uh, significant reduction in muscle soreness immediately post, 12 hours post, and 24 hours post in the float trial when compared to the control trial. And in physical fatigue, we had a significant difference 12 hours post. We also saw significant in increases in the pressure to pain threshold uh, following the float, float trial compared to con uh, yep, compared to the control. In terms of uh, the sprint or the speed, we saw a significant reduction in 10 and 15 meter split times uh, with moderate effect sizes, uh, 12 hours post. Strength, uh, we don't really know. Uh, there was a small effect size in favor of the float trial, um, but this was not significant. In power, there was a significant increase in counter movement jump uh, performance 12 hours post in the float trial compared to, to control. So what's next? Um, I think this, this, this work that we've just finished and, and hopefully will be published soon is, is really given us an appetite to do some more work and, and look at um, some other questions in this space. Um, I, I think the two studies that, are, that I pr presented today were both uh, acute floats, looking at uh, what happens after one, a one-off sort of float. It would be really interesting to, ha to have a look at the chronic use of, of float in, in these elite athletes. So having a, lo a look at perhaps uh, floating multiple times um, a week over multiple weeks. And we'd really like to look at the physiological and, and the physical adaptations that, that might come with that. Uh, game day floating is something else that I, I'm really interested in. Um, and that's both pre-match or pre-game and post. Um, Often in, in team sports, and certainly the team sports that, that I work with, um, on game day, um, it's really common for them to, to have a nap. So have a sort of a one hour nap um, in the middle of the day. Sometimes that's just to, to kill the sort of boredom while they're waiting for their game or that sort of thing, or just even to catch up on, on lost sleep throughout the week. So I think perhaps if we, we looked at float in that setting or of doing a game day float um, around midday, that'd be really interesting to look at what happens to, to subsequent uh, performance. But also post game, and we've published quite a lot of work looking at, at different team sports and what happens after the night of a match. And it's not uncommon for, for a lot of these athletes to um, fall asleep at a three or four a.m. Uh, the next morning, and that's due to a whole host of of both uh, physiological and psychological reasons. But we need to come up with ways that we can um, we can help there because they just get into this really bad spiral if they're falling asleep at four a.m. Uh, the next morning after a game, that really reduces their recovery and, and the start of the week, week becomes really hard. And if they're playing week in, week out, or even if they're playing once every few days, that's a, that's a real issue. So I think it'll be really interesting. And now that so many professional teams have float tanks in their, in their locker rooms or in their facilities, actually looking at um, floating immediately post-match and seeing if that is, is bringing that, um, that bed time a little bit earlier. And because of, uh, I guess, my interest in sleep, I'd be really interested to look at what happens um, post-float when we put some athletes in a, in a sleep lab and we use full polysomnography to have a look at uh, the sleep stages and, and phases and just see if, if there's any changes, I guess, in, in the architecture or of their sleep following a float. And then I think another thing that we really need to do is compare float with other commonly used uh, recovery strategies. So things like uh, cryotherapy and cold water immersion or ice baths, perhaps compression garments, things that athletes are, are routinely using. There has yet to be any sort of s published studies that looks at float and, and compares it to some of these other recovery um, modalities, which will give us a, a really good idea of the, the efficacy, I guess, of float. So just to finish some uh, acknowledgements, I need to acknowledge um, my fantastic colleagues uh, who have worked on, on these studies uh, with me. Um, also Serenity Float Clinic and, and Charles who owns that. He's been uh, incredibly uh, accommodating with, with the research that we've been doing. So a uh, huge thank you to him. And, and again, just to the, to the float conference and, and to you for, for, for bearing with me um, in my husky voice. Thank you very much. <laughs>